Ladies and gentlemen, I am the American Spy Fox. Here we are, episode three of my video conference with author Max Wallace, Love and Death, Who Killed Kurt Cobain, as well as other publications. This one gets into Dylan Carlson, El Duce, and the infamous Alan Wrench. In this discussion, we try to separate fact from fiction and set the record straight. We take off from where we ended in episode two. You said that uh, you wrote the chapter about loss and about Kurt last. Why? Because I was scared to write it. I mean, you know, it's one thing to write about getting stitches when you're 12 years old, or it's one thing to write about, you know, taking your kids to the daddy-daughter dance. It's another thing to write about something that you've barely spoken about with, uh, with people close to you. I mean, I revealed some things in that story that I've never told my closest friends. Um, I was scared to write it. I mean, you know, uh, first of all, I knew what people wanted me to write. I think that people um, have a lot of unanswered questions, as do I. You came out uh, recently and said, there are no more lost, unreleased Nirvana tracks. They're, they're all out there. But you did say there's a whack of video footage that's, that's not been put together. So there are no more unfinished tracks or unreleased tracks, but there's a ton of video. There's a ton of video. You said it. We're going to reissue Nevermind on vinyl, a 180 gram. Courtney's going to allow that? Um, yeah, we're going to allow it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a great record. I want to talk about everybody wants to hear about dylan carlson how do you get to talk to that guy because he seems like a tough character to crack to to even get to you know but right. you ended well, up talking to him we, we ended up undercover talking to him and again it goes back to this this sort of uh drug scene this seattle drug scene these bulgarian musicians that ian knew um and we they they arranged they they knew they knew dylan from the seattle music scene and from the seattle heroin scene dealings and and they let us know that dylan was going to be at this infamous uh seattle shooting gallery at you know two o'clock in the afternoon on this day if we go there we will we'll see him and uh, we could talk to him you know and uh so we did Ma max we, by shooting gallery what what do you mean shooting by gallery that? is where people at at that time, I, I I guess they're still prevalent, but uh, people would go to hang out and shoot up, right? So okay. Because like, uh, Dylan Dylan and Kurt were known to target practice a lot, so I just wanted to, you know, right? Okay. <laughs> no, it, yeah, it's a very different type of uh, shooting gallery, right? <laughs> but uh, so this was in the the um, University District of Seattle, very seedy place, but also yeah, I've been all over a lot of musicians. District. I don't think Kurt ever went to this place, but Dylan Dylan would go and jam, and then he'd shoot up. So we were told he'd be there at a certain time. Make sure you get there at this time, and talk, make sure you talk to him in the first twenty minutes because after that he'll shoot up and he will be incoherent. Right. So we uh, maneuvered to accidentally bump into him. Ian is a musician. I think I think Ian had his saxophone or his guitar with him um, with the idea that he could jam with Dylan and we just start chatting with him. And, and yet we wanted to capture this on video. We were about to go on tour with Hank Harrison with, with this whole thing. So we were trying to clandestinely uh, uh, capture a lot of this stuff on on video. So we end up uh, bumping into him. We, we ask, you know, oh, I recognize you. Didn't you know Kurt Cobain? Weren't you somehow involved? And he said, yeah, you know, I was his best friend. I'm the, I'm the one that bought him the gun. And we ended up talking to him for 25 minutes. We Ian jammed with him. We he, he wondered why we were videoing this. We pretended we were tourists from Canada and we just wanted to sort of capture <laughs> the scene or Ian, Ian uh, uh, jamming. And he let us. I don't really follow the the case that much. You probably know a lot more about the case today. You're really up to date on it, right? But but every once in a while, somebody invites me to one of these groups. And so I'm on Facebook for 21 days with one of these groups. And I see a lot of that right. chat. And I, I, I also get um, contacted a lot by people, sort of amateur detectives uh, following the case with questions. And I try well, to answer it and be... Right, helpful. right. But... but um, there's a lot of uh, people that seem to believe that Dylan must be involved. 
how could yeah, Dylan yeah. bought him the gun and, and not be aware, you know? And then Tom had his own experience with Dylan bringing him around the house. But we never talked about the murder theory per se. We were just innocent, you know, tourists who just accidentally recognized him as far right. as you didn't want to but, give yourself away and exactly get to yeah but he talked yeah. about it right he we we drew a lot of stuff about, about kurt about the gun about and one thing that was very clear and this was not an act he was not uh you know this is his best friend right like kurt kurt said this was his best friend he knew him better than anybody dylan and, carlson he, was actually kurt cobain's first fan the very first show right. kurt did right. dylan was there he goes up to him and says man you are so talented you're gonna be yeah. you know so yeah Dylan's a pretty good musician himself by the way uh nick broomfield ends up using dylan's uh, music in his in his film kurt and courtney uh, but, earth but, but, earth isn't it yeah, the big, exactly okay, okay okay and so you just there's no way that he believed kurt was suicidal you know, I mean, he said, I would never have bought him the gun. You could just tell this was not an act. He didn't know who we were. He didn't know we were investigating. Right. It was so obvious, right? This became a pattern later on. We've spoken to a lot of people that knew him well, but this is Dylan who knew him. And that that really stood out that you, you could tell he was absolutely sincere. He had no idea. He'd never heard Kurt talk about suicide and, and you know, Rome was an accident, et cetera, et cetera. So um he that probably had a lot there. of guilt for and yet him. people were suspicious and rightfully so i understand why people are suspicious of dylan the circumstances but he also told us we, we brought up courtney right and he's he had been arrested he gets arrested a lot right for i guess drug it, charges whatever yeah yeah it happens and <laughs> courtney bails him out courtney pays his rent at that time i mean we're again we're talking 25 years ago right but courtney was paying his rent courtney's still paying the rent for a lot of these hangers on you know so you could say oh well that proves that she's buying buying these people silence right she's she's financing their 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 lifestyle uh to keep them silent about her role but no you could also say that courtney is very generous to her friends or friends of kurt and she's trying to take care so of you're them. saying that courtney love just has a big heart I'm not necessarily saying that, but I'm saying that it's easy to come to that conclusion when you talk to yeah. Dylan Carlson. This is something, you know, he talked about, oh, Courtney, he didn't like Courtney. You could tell. He, did he, he did he seem perfect. um kind of like, I know you probably didn't ask, but did he seem to kind of be like, you know, I don't know why she always bails me out kind of thing or. No, or... I think he thought that you know, she's taking care of Kurt's friends, right? Okay. They, okay. Know, later on, Tom, Tom was looking for Callie at one point, Michael DeWitt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine lives in Echo Park in Los Angeles down the, she has, uh, she had two dogs. One of them recently died, but she, you know, if you're a dog walker, if, you, if you're a that. dog owner, you you have to walk your dogs. Right. So she's walking her dog. She bumps, bumps into Patty Schemmel, uh walking two dogs and they start chatting and she she tells her these are courtney's dogs <laughs> she's looking wait, wait. so so dog. so uh, talk, starts talking to her like it's just a neighbor or she knows this is patty schimmel she has no home. idea who that is she's not so even it's just a, a neighbor fan, right i i think she calls me from la to tell me this because she knows that i've written a book or two books about about uh kurt cobain says oh you know who i bumped into and then she invited me over for drinks, and this guy Michael DeWitt was there, who was also <laughs> all these what? people. You know, I think we had been searching for Michael DeWitt at one point. All these people, you know, are just down the street. And and again, this is you know decades later, and Courtney is paying Patty's rent, financing Patty. Patty has had her own drug habit. I don't know her current status, but yeah, she's looking yeah. after her dogs in exchange or whatever, right? But like, so there's this whole circle. That that Courtney is financed. And, and Callie's living with Patty? No. Or, he, or he's he, just he's just there for the party. He, and... At that time. So there's been a whole bunch of stuff since that I've seen about he's an artist and had an yeah, art. Yeah, he he ended up getting a bunch of new teeth and now he's on H and M commercials. Right. Yeah. But this was uh so I yeah, I don't even know if that's uh if 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 Michael if Callie was uh being financed by it, we also met Callie's family years years ago at at the Callie's family was hired to take down the greenhouse, by the way, to add to the conspiracy. His dad, 
his but we dad. Met the, we met the dad. They're millionaires, right? So Callie certainly doesn't need to be. Callie's uh, parents by are millionaires? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a million dollar construction company I, at that time. It was I was always under million. the impression that he was just some runaway kid that Courtney took under his wing. Right. I think like that's how a lot of people old. perceive him. A lot of people perceive him like that. Right. Because, you know, these, these are still junkies. Let's, well, let's he, face he may, it. Right. Exactly. He may all have, junkies. The family may have shunned him in his early life for living that sort of lifestyle. I could see that. You know, when we I mean? asked the dad, I remember asking the dad who was on the site, you know, hey, where's Cali? <laughs> haven't seen Cali for a while as if we're old friends. And he right. said, California, why do you think he's called Cali? And that's that's all we we could right. probe that. But I don't know if it was the greenhouse they were taking down at the time, but I guess it was, right? So yeah, we they, she took the down the whole garage, pack. the whole thing. Yeah. Gone. Richard Lee gave us a tour of the original house and greenhouse when it was still completely intact. And you could just walk right up to the door if you wanted to. There was nobody there. I was and there in 2007, and uh, of course, the greenhouse was long gone. And even still at that point, you could walk right up to it if you right. wanted to. Uh, there's like a fence around it now. The uh, Starbucks CEO bought it because it, it's uh, adjoining his land, and he didn't like it. And it, that's a whole other story. But, well, um, there's a constant pilgrimage of, uh, of exactly of fans, you know, and there's a famous bench up the street where you, people scroll. Yeah, there. I carved my initials, and in. I'm one of those yeah, yeah. that went there. And, yeah, okay, uh, right. I'll never forget the motliest of all, Richard Lee, giving us a guided tour of the of the place and all the significant sites in Seattle. You know, what was that like hanging out with Richard Lee? Well, at that time, I. I he turned at some point, you know, he was very friendly at first. He, well, he had always been talking about how he hated his life. He wanted to die like a million other times. He's locked himself in the bathroom with a gun and Courtney's tried to stop him. She's called the police to yeah, help him so, why would so many times. Him? Why would all of a sudden she just decide, I don't like you, bang. Well, let me tell you about that. That occurred on March 18th here, two years ago. Yeah. Courtney called the Seattle Police Department. She said, my husband's in the bathroom and he's going to kill himself with a gun. And then the police showed up at the door, and Kurt said, no, that never happened. I was merely locking myself in a room to get away from my wife, who was, whatever, annoying me or whatever. And then the police said, uh, Ms. Love Cobain, did he really have a gun? And she said, well, no, I didn't actually see a gun. There wasn't really a gun. No, there wasn't a gun, and no, yeah, he but, didn't threaten to kill himself. But if she In other called, words, she recanted the entire story. Yeah, but if she spot. called the police, she must have been worried about him because he's always, all his songs are like depressing and stuff. Yes, but you see, he, killed him, he uh, allegedly killed himself, according to the official version of events two weeks later. And it readily explains the whole thing to people if you say, oh, well, but you understand. I mean, when I asked for an explanation from you as to why you think he would kill himself, the first thing you said was, well, there was this incident, and he had threatened to kill himself in the incident, when, in fact, he denied that that occurred. And then, when the police said, uh, dear but, wife, are you denying that this occurred? She said, yes, okay, I'm denying I made it yeah, up. Yeah, but, but okay. Courtney was off doing wait, a wait, photo wait. shoot or something when he did this. She so was how, in Los Angeles, in yeah, jail. Yeah, so how could she kill him? She was in jail. But she was in jail. How could she kill him on the day if she was in jail? She didn't do the deed. She had others do it for her, if that's what happened. No. Courtney Love the... did not kill him. I don't exactly know what turned him. I think we describe it in the first book. And then... Well, you, you stole the case from him, man. You took his guess... You took his light. His, his... I mean, at that time, I think he was more resentful of Tom Grant. And oh, okay. It was getting a lot of publicity, but our book hadn't come out and Kirk and Courtney hadn't come out yet. Right. So that really exploded. Like, let's face it, we made money on this case. And that's another thing. You've got to give Tom Grant credit. Tom Grant could have made money. He could have written a book in the beginning. A, a lot more money than, than he did. Yeah. You could say he tried to cash in later on. Right. But we're the ones that made the real money. Uh, Nick Broomfield, who made Kirk and Courtney, made millions off that film. Yeah. Yeah. And mainly because Courtney tried to suppress it and it made worldwide headlines. Right. But we made right. Then people are like, what, what is she trying to suppress? Yeah. Right. Richard Lee has been doing this uh, TV show. If he's still doing it for decades, he was the first person. He's never made any money off this case. I can see him being resentful of these people that came in and, like you say, stole the case from him. Right? I, so, I wouldn't say. You know, I don't want to say stole it. I would say you did a more thorough job, a more professional job, and plus you had 
a publication. You you know, you had right. a, a means to distribute. So yeah. Yeah, but, but I, I could see him resenting us. He definitely did resent us, right? He went on a crusade. I think he devoted a lot of his uh, uh, coverage yeah. to trying to discredit us. Or I, I heard he even harassed Chris at one of his political meetings. And, and what did you say? words to the Cobain story. Um, um, but Kurt Cobain has nothing to do. Your hands off my equipment. Yeah, Brooks, yeah, University. And you're not a part of the university, dumbass. Stop pretending. Mm -hmm. Come on, hey. come on now, let's go. Okay, so we're sitting in the press on the airline flying. I'm going to put this on YouTube, this is going to be hilarious. Are you taping it? Yeah. Come on, but nobody wants to hear. You never seen me telling the truth. I got a question, hey. I got a question, yeah. And somebody else. I got a question. Why are these people grabbing it? Hey. Why are these people grabbing it? Hey. Why are these people this is hilarious. <laughs> Duffy, dude. Hey, oh, Duffy. get the fuck out of here, Yeah. Oh yeah, Chris. Uh, I think Chris uh, filed a restraining order against him. I think a whole bunch of people have filed a restraining order against him. But the first time we met him, he didn't seem like that out there. You know, he definitely had issues. It's the medium is the message, right? But in retrospect, like some of the cons so-called conspiracy theorists that have emerged over the years that we've encountered are genuinely batshit crazy, right? Like there's a Brazilian journalist that interviewed us years ago. She seemed perfectly uh respectable and respectful and mm -hmm. you know i really liked her i think she came to one of our events she published a in portuguese a profile about our book and then she approached us uh years later fairly recently and started asking do you remember me i i interviewed you and you know now i can google people right so i google some of her her writings and she's like this uh she's embraced the illuminati conspiracy theories which a lot of conspiracy theory th this was one of the original conspiracy theories right long before you know trump or or anybody but as soon as i saw that i'm like i don't want to have anything to do with this person right like you have you know the the whole even the words conspiracy theory back then had a stigma um today of course it's a whole whole new thing since covid and since trump but but um but anybody who embraces the illuminati and the kurt cobain uh murder theory it's like they're going to be dismissed and written off right like you know you're i think you've achieved a certain degree of credibility your show um because Thanks. you're not a wild eye conspiracy theorist you're you're quite you seem quite grounded you seem to be you know really focused on the facts you you've worked hard to try to to assemble the the various players and uh you had your your run in with tom grant but then you you made up with tom grant right but like you got tom grant uh to 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 come aboard right now now i'm here right and i wouldn't have done that if you were one of these one of these people right so i sort of you know i i stay far away if i i, I probably google the person you know see what else they've out there on social media and 90 percent of the time i just won't uh won't respond right so um it, it is like even for our credibility right like our book came out in 1998 who killed kirk Cobain? that was the mm -hmm. first book and the new yorker one of the most respected publications in the united states reviewed it and called it a judicious presentation of explosive material so that's a very credible publication pretty, pretty powerful statement yeah, but also, you know, they they saw that the book itself, both of our books, really went out of their way to uh, try to shoot down uh, some of the conspiracy theories and really tried to focus on the facts, what's provable and what's not. And and some of these amateur sleuths and amateur detectives do the same thing. There's some sites out there um, that you know, somebody will post one of their theories and say, well, this makes sense. But then this theory is uh, do doesn't make sense. Right. So they're they're constantly sorting 
out that you know sort of debating fiction. and you have to do that right like it gives you credibility me uh -huh. who haven't really followed this case for 25 years occasionally stumble upon something like this and say hey that person they've done more due diligence than i have in the last 20 years right so well that's that, that brings us back to el duce so at some point you know we we stumble upon el duce el duce elden hope <laughs> and the whole i think probably most of your your viewers are familiar with with oh, yeah. Yeah. but it sort of you know it brings it brings up another of the unlikely conspiracy theories so but at that time we heard that el duce was about to appear on hard copy uh, which was a big yeah yeah i read that of, of that era that yeah and before they would have him on hard copy they insisted on a polygraph Right. Because if you meet El Duce, which I did, I got to hang out with El Duce. Um, hey, by the way, I want to mention uh, Max was hired as a consultant by Nick Broomfield for Kurt and Courtney. I'm not I'm unsure if a lot of people know that or not. So this all ties in together. You know, he, not only was I a consultant for uh, Nick Broomfield, but I inadvertently introduced Nick Broomfield or very intentionally introduced Nick Broomfield to El Duce. So for people out there that believe that El Duce got murdered uh, because of what he blurted out in Kurt and Courtney, it's right. my fault, but I don't believe that and neither does Tom Grant, right? Like El if you spent, and again, I'm one of the few people, including Tom Grant, that spent any time with El Duce. I met El Duce. And when you meet El Duce, you realize that you can't take anything he says or does seriously, right? Because he's just a, uh, he's uh, to put it charitably. I, I, uh, let, let me, let me tell you this. Unstable drunk. I, yes. I, I have never met Eldon Hoke, but right. I have met El Duce. I've met, I've met guys just like him. Just you know like what him, I mean? Yeah. The, Although the town drunk. I've never met anybody quite like Eldon Hoke, but so Eldon Hoke, <laughs> you know, hard copy is not going to have somebody like him on. Uh, with his story that that Courtney Love approached him and you know offered him fifty thousand dollars on New Year's Eve to to kill her old man, but they hired one of the probably the most respected polygraph expert in in the United States and paid him a lot of money to administer a polygraph test and uh, Doctor Edward Gelb, right? And and so we got a hold of that polygraph test where he scores 99.9 percent .9 reliability and that's when i started taking him a little more seriously i i genuinely believe his story that she approached him on new year's eve a neat discovery while i was editing this video you guys know about natalie wood's case she supposedly fell off the boat and drowned in 1981 31 years later in 2012 through her sister's uh perseverance she has the death certificate changed from accidental drowning to accidental drowning with undetermined factors the same doctor dr edward gelb who conducted el duce's polygraph examination conducted the captain of that boat that natalie wood was on he conducted his polygraph examination so dr gelb has assisted in changing death certificates and it's happened in the recent past from a very old cold case. This is why I keep pushing the petition. If you haven't signed it, read it below, click the link, read it and sign it. We need at least, at least 50,000 signatures. And we're at about 6,000. Is it true that he did two? He did two polygraph examinations? I've heard that there's others, but that's the only one I know. And I have a copy of that. <clears throat> test i i, I oh yeah wow you i had to copy. pay to get that that was that's a whole other story about the kind of people who were sort of manipulating el duce it was a bit suspicious but um, but so and then of course years later and and if tom grant is watching this now he's cringing because he does not like the idea of anybody talking about alan wrench as a as a player in this story right but alan wrench i wrote we write about in our in our second book Alan Ranch basically claims to have done it. And yeah, yeah. Let, let's let's get to the bottom of this. I, I want to know what's going yeah. on with this guy because I've never written about him, but people have asked me to. Well, go, I never go, knew go who Alan Ranch was. When I met El Duce, I, you know, I got I spent time with him. 
wrote them off, saw the polygraph test, took it more seriously. I started to believe that Courtney, this is the most convincing evidence that not only does Courtney have a motive, motive but if this happened, this is a very powerful piece of circumstantial evidence, at least, right? El, Absolutely. El, uh, El Duce definitely didn't kill Kurt and doesn't claim to have killed Kurt. He just claims that she offered him $50,000. So then I introduce uh, El Duce to Nick Broomfield. Nick Broomfield just want, was interested in the colorful cast of characters, right? He wasn't really interested in a genuine investigation, but there's so many characters involved in this, including Hank Harrison, who he made look much more foolish than Hank actually was. Um, but but so anybody who's watched Kirk and Courtney knows that uh, El Duce is interviewed by Nick Broomfield and blurts out some, I forget exactly what he says. You're probably more familiar. He says, uh, Alan did it or something like that. And then I don't yeah. know, two weeks later, he's killed on the tracks, right? He's run yeah. over by the train. So, so that happened. And that's a pretty powerful scene, right? Like you hear yeah. this and you hear, even I was a bit struck, right? Like, you know, one more suspicious death. But, you know, and Tom Grant has really investigated this. He wasn't murdered. If Again, if you spend any time with Alduce, you know that it's a miracle that he hadn't been run over by a train years before, right? He was always stumbling drunk. And so perfectly plausible that he just stumbled onto the train tracks and was run over by a train. And yet, what what about the him blurting out Alan? Like, this is Alan Ranch. He's referring yeah. to they were friends. They were friends from the, the Riverside and uh, L.A. punk circles. Um, and so we we met with with Alan Ranch, this guy Alan Ranch in Riverside, like kind of a seedy town uh, near near Los Angeles. Um, and we we had we had lunch with him at a steakhouse, and he's you know he it was very clear, and I think we talk about this in our book that it's very clear he wants us to believe that he killed Kurt that he's the one that did it, that Courtney, you know, enlisted him to kill Kurt and he's the one that did it. And so he's a bit of a narcissist, but really smart guy, much smarter than El Duce. Even when El Duce is sober, I never met him when he was sober, but it's pretty clear, you know, you're, you're talking to, uh, to uh, Alan Ranch and he's a smart guy, but a very manipulative guy. And so my theory, and this is only a theory, I have no evidence to back this up, but I'm 100% sure that this is what happened. Alan Ranch told, you know, El Duce was telling everybody about this uh, encounter with Courtney on New Year's Eve that she offered him $50,000. Right. Alan, Alan Ranch told him, oh, I, I ended up doing it. I ended up killing him. And so El Duce is... is naive enough or malleable enough to believe this so when he blurted out that alan did it i think he genuinely believed that but that doesn't mean that alan wrench actually did it it was very clear first of all you know the the one suspicious thing is we we um we treated him to lunch at a steakhouse and we go out into the parking lot and he drives off in a mercedes or a lexus or something like that a very expensive car and we, right double take how could somebody like this be driving a sixty thousand dollar car and so we ended up you know spending the rest of the afternoon uh asking around about uh, uh, does anybody know him sure enough every bar in in that uh, vicinity people of course is. and this bartender this woman behind the bar says oh yeah he's a plumber he fixed my uh he fixes my toilet and i realized ah a plumber can afford a lexus right he Absolutely. wasn't. In other words, as soon as I knew he was a plumber, I realized, no, Courtney didn't pay him, you know, fifty thousand dollars to to kill her husband. It was pretty obvious that he right. was financially independent. And the, story, the story going around that I still see going around on the internet is he was just this poor, broke loser. Right. That's and what then I thought. Suddenly, he had all yeah. this money, but that's yeah. not true. He was actually a contractor. Yeah, not only a contractor, but a very rich contractor. I mean, you know, plumbers make more than $100,000 a year, right? Oh, Even, yeah. Right? So it was pretty clear that he could afford that car for what he does. And I guess that's how he got his uh, his name, his moniker, Alan Wrench, as well, right? But uh, right, right, right. once you so, see that... So he, he's thought this through, and he's yeah. he, he knows what's going on. And he's, well, I want to get people to believe. So right. he actually lies to his friend 
or El DJ. Yeah, I'd say he tells man. tall tales, and you know, a smart person will will hear him and realize that it's just bluster. But somebody like El Duce would is blind, it. right? Maybe he's even a bit afraid of Alan. Because, oh, if you kill Kirk Cobain, maybe he'll kill me. I don't know. Right, this is speculation. But you know, Tom, ne Tom never really forgave us. Every time I see Tom. Like, I can't believe that you wrote about Alan Ranch, even though I think in the book, I think we make it very clear that we did not believe that Alan had anything to do with it. He's just one of many colorful well, characters involved in this case. Right. It's also important that you dismiss people, you know, that that's what uh, the, the police would do. A detective would do. You have to you have your list of suspects and then, OK, this guy didn't do it. This guy didn't do it. I, right. I, I understand why you would include that in the book. Sure. You know, so, but it's also colorful, right? So I, I like, you know, well, yeah, I, the guys all over it. YouTube saying I killed Kurt Cobain. I'll never right. be convicted. Like, come on, man. I can't talk to you today, 28 years later, or whatever about the minute details of the case and all the evidence. Right. I, I remember the, the basics, but I, I can talk in detail about these colorful characters that we encountered along the way. Yeah. Right. This was for me, the highlight in a way, of doing these investigations so, right like, but just to make it clear obviously wrench no he, he he did not kill kurt cobain are you positive didn't he didn't do it. Kill dylan carlson it. dylan carlson didn't do it i'll state that with 100 certainty too and i don't believe that dylan carlson knows who did it 